Welcome on the Restoration Era. The Restoration Era uh, is contained in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, as well as the prophets Haggai and Zechariah. We, however, in these sessions are going to look at the book of Nehemiah. And i just like to give a few um, chronological uh, dates to help us in our studies. And basically, in the year 536, the restoration started under Zerubbabel. The restoration, we mean, by the Jews returning from Babylonian captivity, in which they had been in Babylon for something like 70 years. And in 536, Cyrus gave the decree that they were to return to their own land, their own land. They returned under Zerubbabel, and eventually, after many difficulties, they rebuilt the temple. And then, in the year 457, there was a, another king on the throne of the Persian Empire named Artaxerxes, in his seventh year, which was basically in the year 457 B.C., he gave a command that uh, Ezra should return and institute uh, the services of the temple. And then we are now coming to the year of about 445 B.C., which is about the 20th year of Artaxerxes. And we find that Nehemiah is a cupbearer to, indeed, the king. It's a, a position of great uh, esteem. Uh, he had to be a friend. He had to be faithful to the king because he, in actuality, was responsible to hand the wine to the king. And, uh, obviously, the purpose behind this was to ensure that that wine was not poisoned. They were always afraid of assassinations in those days. Well, we come now to the year 445 B.C., the 20th year of Artaxerxes. And Nehemiah has his brother and some of his friends uh, return from Jerusalem. And he asks them, well, what is the situation with the Jews, you know, back in the land of Judea? And uh, they respond, well, they are being very difficult circumstances. They're very impoverished. And also the city of Jerusalem is broken down. The walls are broken down. The gates are broken down. And Nehemiah is in great distress, a man of great compassion, a man of integrity, a man indeed who is deeply concerned for the welfare of the people of God. And he starts to weep. Well, the next day, he is in the presence of the king, and the king notices a change, and he's very sad, and he says, well, why are you so sad, seeing that you're not sick? And Nehemiah becomes fearful, because in the presence of a king, you were always joyful, giving the impression to the king that uh, he was a wonderful man, and it was wonderful to be able to uh, live in his kingdom. But uh, here, Nehemiah is deeply concerned. And then he prays, and he says to the king, look, I'm deeply concerned about the condition of the city of Jerusalem and my people there. And uh, our text says, he says, well, what, what do you want me to do? And uh, what is your request? And Nehemiah prays again, and he says uh, that you would send me back as the governor uh, to watch over my people and to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. Well, that's exactly what the king uh, gave the commandment to do. And so Nehemiah sets off with letters from the king. He sets off with an escort. It's about 700 miles roughly from where he was in the capital city of the Persian Empire at that time, Shushan. And uh, he goes back through the Mesopotamia 
uh, crescent, as we call it, and back into the land of Israel. He comes to the city of Jerusalem, and he sees a deplorable condition. The walls are broken down, the gates are not there, all the gate posts are destroyed and so forth. And then he gathers the nobles together and he said, look, God has put it in my heart to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. And moreover, we have a command from the king to so do. Now then, the book of Nehemiah then comes into chapter 3. And in chapter 3 of Nehemiah, we are told the ten gates, the names of the ten gates of that city. Now, the importance of those ten gates from our perspective is that they are in reality about ten spiritual steps along the spiritual life for a Christian, for us today. And so looking at these gates, we're not looking at them just from a physical point of view, but rather we're looking at them from the spiritual intent that these gates have for us. Well, what are those gates? Well, starting off, we have what is called the Sheep Gate. The Sheep Gate. And uh, that starts our spiritual journey. You know, we are told that we are all like sheep that have gone astray. And... You know, sheep, they go from one side to another. One thing that is important when considering sheep is that they cannot live alone. They absolutely need a shepherd to watch over them. And so we're introduced in the New Testament, in John 10, to the Lord Jesus Christ saying, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. And then he goes on to say, well, I am the door of the sheepfold. If anybody enter in, he shall find rest. And so this is the first step in our Christian life. It is to come to the sheep gate. Now, I want to say this, that the sheep are absolutely dependent upon the shepherd. And therefore we need to be under the care of the good shepherd. We need to come to Christ, who is the door, the door of the sheepfold, the door into heaven. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one cometh to the Father but by me. Have you entered into that door? Have you accepted Christ as your Savior? But I want to go on further into another consideration. Yes, Jesus is, well, as Peter said, the chief shepherd. But, you know, God has given to his people shepherds. They are called pastors and uh, maybe reverends, vicars and so forth. But they are given by God to care for us. And we all need a shepherd to watch over our soul. And so that is why church attendance is so important. You know, church attendance is like coming into the sheepfold. After a week, perhaps, of turmoil out in the world, out where the dangers are, we need to come each week into that sheepfold. We need to come into the door of the church. We need to care and receive care. Because, in a sense, we are to care for one another, too. And... Uh, they are to care for us, but above all, it is the pastor who has a responsibility, the ultimate responsibility of looking after our souls. And so I want to encourage you to pray and ask God, Lord, which congregation would you have me be a participant of? And knowing that, you know, go to the pastor and say, look, I want to come to church, I want to be fed. You know, one of the responsibilities of a natural shepherd is to care for the sheep and to see that they're well fed. And he, indeed, 
leads them into green pastures and so that they are well nourished. But the spiritual shepherd, you know, is responsible for feeding us. And how does he feed us? From the word of God. It is his messages that will feed the inner man, that will strengthen the inner man, will enable us to face again another week in the world, a week of trauma, a week of battles, a week of temptations perhaps. And his sermons and his uh, leading us into truth and teaching us the truth of God's word will strengthen us indeed for the week ahead. And so I want to say this, that this first gate is the gate of the sheepfold. It is the gate in Jerusalem. All the sheep were guided, you know, by the shepherd, led by the shepherd, brought by the shepherd, counted to make sure that nobody was missing, and brought in to that uh, sheepfold where they were nourished. Well, now... I want to say this, that the prime necessity in our life is first to come to the chief shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ, and ask him to receive us as his savior, as our savior. He is the savior of the world and we want him to be our savior, to come into our hearts and save us. And then to watch over us, to guide us, we pray to him and we read his word. But we do need the under-shepherds, as uh, Peter calls us, the under-shepherds to look after us. And so I plead with you, you know, pray and ask the Lord, Lord, lead me to a congregation. Lead me to a pastor of your choosing that you want me to submit to and to receive from him instruction and teaching so that by the grace of God, you know, I will be well cared for. Well, that is the first uh, of the uh, gates of Jerusalem. And now we come to the next gate. Now, the next gate is called the fish gate. It's where those who sold fish and brought the fish from uh, either the Sea of Galilee or the Mediterranean, uh, they brought it to Jerusalem and sold it there. Now, what is the spiritual significance of the fish gate in our lives? Well, you know, the disciples, most of them were fishermen. And they plied their trade in the Sea of Galilee. And, you know, there were many miracles around that Sea of Galilee. And some of those miracles included tremendous harvests of fish. And uh, in one of them, you know, uh, the Lord said to Peter, well, have you uh, caught anything? And Peter said, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. And then the interesting thing was this, that the Lord said, well, cast out thy net on the other side. And uh, Peter said, well, at thy word, I will do so. He did so. And... He got so many fish. He had to call his friends in their boats, the other apostles, and said, come help me because my boat is sinking. You see, the Lord gave an abundant harvest of fish. Well, he then continues by saying to Peter, and now you will be fishers of men. I don't know if you've noticed that some Christians wear little fish in their lapel. And, uh, you know, it is to denote that after we have come through the sheep gate and we have come under the care of the Good Shepherd, we are now to go out. And in going out, we are to become fishers of men. <clears throat> what is a fisher of men? Well, basically, what is a fisherman? A fisherman goes out to catch the fish. And that is exactly what the Lord wants us to do. He wants us to go out and bring in others. Bring in others. You know, 
Cain and Abel, you've probably heard of, the first two sons of Adam. And uh, Cain killed Abel. And uh, the Lord spoke to Cain, well, where is your brother Abel? And uh, Cain facetiously said, you know, am I my brother's keeper? But in a very real sense, we are our brother's keeper. And so you see, we are to bring in the fish. We are to bring in the fish. And as we work with the Lord and pray, then we shall bring in abundant harvest of fish. And, you know, basically, we are under his command. And how wonderful it is, you know, on that resurrection morning, when we can display, if I could say this, the souls that we have won for him. And so we are to be fishers of men. You know, not only are we sheep, but we are to be fishers of men, looking after the needs of others. And so in a very real sense, you know, once we are a Christian, we are responsible to look after and care for others and bring others in. So that is, you know, our duty. Once we are a Christian, it is our duty to bring others in. Bring others in from a world of sin. Bring others in so that they will not go to an eternity in hell. And you know, the older I get, the more concerned I have for the souls of others. Because heaven and hell become an ever greater reality to one as one grows older. And I am so concerned for the lost. I am concerned that their eternity will be in hell. And I so desperately want to reach out a hand, to lift someone up and bring them into the kingdom so that their eternity will be spent in heaven and not in hell. The hell flames are very real to me. The smoke of hell and the pungent smell and odor of hell are very real to me. And I would do anything I can to indeed save someone from the flames of eternal damnation and torment. That essentially is what a fisher of men is. That essentially, indeed, is what the significance of the fish gate is. It is to save people from hell. But then, you see, the next thing that we have to consider is this. That when one is a Christian, what should one do? Well, we come now to the next gate, which is called the old gate. Now, the old gate essentially means, from the prophet Jeremiah, to stand in the way and ask for the old paths. In other words, the old paths, the paths that the saints of old walked in, the paths that we see even from Genesis, laid out in Genesis, and indeed flow through the word of God the old paths, and essentially they are the teachings, the teachings of the fathers. And i just like to look at some of these teachings with you because after we are saved, after we bring people in, we've got to nourish them and build them up. And how do we build them up? And on what truths do we build them up? Well, these are delineated for us in Hebrews chapter 6, and verses 1 to 3. And the first one is repentance. Now, what is repentance? Well, repentance essentially is that one is walking in one direction and then one repents and turns around and walks in the opposite direction. How am I going to illustrate that? Well, the Word of God, of course, provides me with a very good illustration because in Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul says, Look, Those that stole, when they come to Christ, steal no more, and they turn around and work with their hands 
in order to give to those that have need. That is repentance, a complete turnaround in one's life. And that is an essentiality. You cannot live in the old ways of sin and expect to get to heaven. No, you have to turn around and repent. And then after that, there are the teachings of faith toward God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And so, in a very real sense, we have to be men and women of faith. And in fact, everything we do should be by faith, believing that we are doing the will of God. In fact, the Apostle Paul writing in Romans says, you know, that which is not of faith is sin. We have to be men and women of faith. And how does faith indeed uh, grow in our lives? It grows from the preaching of God's word, that's why you have to go to church, the preaching of God's word, and the reading of God's word, and hearing testimonies from faithful men. And then afterwards, you see our faith grows, and our faith is strong. And the Apostle Paul says, I live, yet not I, but I live by the faith of the Son of God, who hath made me free. All right. Then... What is the next? Well, there are the ordinances of baptisms, water baptism. Oh, how the Lord Jesus Christ made that so very clear to John the Baptist. When John the Baptist said, well, look, you coming to me to be baptized, I have need to be baptized of you. And Jesus said, no, it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And water baptism is an act of righteousness is an ordinance whereby we follow the Lord into the waters of baptism. What does it mean? It means simply this, that we are buried with Christ, we go down under the water, and we come up in newness of life. In other words, we are determined by that act to indeed walk with Christ in newness of life, in the life that he would be pleasing to him. And then there's the Holy Spirit baptism. Baptism of the Holy Spirit, whereby on the Acts of uh, Acts of the Apostles, chapter two, and the day of Pentecost, when it was fully come, there the disciples were gathered together in one room, 120 of them, and there they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak with other tongues. And you know, throughout the Acts of the Apostles, you know, there are countless illustrations records of when believers came to Christ afterwards they were prayed for and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke in other tongues a very wonderful experience which I encourage every one of you you know to uh, participate in and ask God for go to your pastor ask him to lay on hands because the next uh, shall I say doctrine is the laying on of hands whereby the pastor would lay hands upon you to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, to speak frequently, fluently in other tongues, and also, you know, for healing. Healing. You know, one of the great uh, blessings of the passion of Christ was he gave his back to the smiters so that we might be healed. We are healed by his stripes. And then... There is the resurrection of the dead. We must realize that we will be resurrected. The resurrection of the just, where those that are righteous will stand before Christ and receive the rewards of the deeds that they have done in the flesh. And there's a resurrection of the wicked, where the wicked, the books will be opened and they will be cast into the lake of fire. And I implore you, you know, to consider this life so short. But at the end, you know, the last of the, um, shall I say, elementary doctrines of Christ, the old doctrines, is eternal judgment. And we have to remember that there's warning after warning given in the Word of God, the Old Testament, the New Testament, concerning the fact 
that we must all stand before the throne of Christ to receive the rewards of the things that we have done in the flesh. And those that have lived uprightly, given their hearts to the Lord, walked in obedience, gone to church and, you know, studied God's word and lived uprightly, they shall hear these beautiful words, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. But the others will hear the words, depart from me, ye wicked, depart from me, depart from me. You see, the unbelieving, you know, those who have not believed in Christ, the wicked, the adulterers, the thieves, the liars, and so forth. All those will have no part in the kingdom of God. And therefore, as we close this session, I just want to remind you of these three gates, these first three gates, the sheep hold. Have you entered in? Is Christ your Savior? Is he the good shepherd looking after you? Are you being watched over by an earthly pastor to ensure that you are well fed, you stay on the pathway of righteousness? And then the fish gate, are you seeking the souls of others? And also, are you studying the word of God? You see, to build yourself up in the most holy faith, so that by the grace of God, you understand the word of God, you understand the ways of God, you're walking in them, and you're glorifying God, and you are fulfilling his will. God bless you.